Ishi. Quiet time. Uh, where would she even stab something like that? Stay close, Ishii. That's one heavy bird. I'm not too proud to admit when I'm scared. Terrified, actually. So alone. Never alone. Is the Kaizo reached? Here. We have been here, where are the gates of Akaizo. We guard the silence of Akaizo. You are a disturbance. No, no one remains, no one returns. Aethas has disturbed the bones of Akaizo. The old pacts permit him to pass, but you will go no further. A Kaizo is closed. The gates are barred. Our covenant with the Old Ones does not forbid questions. The living were meant to forget O Kaizo. Nothing can be gained of remembering it. A challenge would be a welcome distraction. Take your reprieve. Doomed one. The chosen people of the dead fire call the Kaizo home. The outsiders were their contemporaries, full of wisdom, ingenuity, and terrifying ambition. That sure sounds like the Ingwithans. Guess they got around. The outsiders passed from the world. None of them remain. Not all of them passed, but we got the one they left behind. The Old Ones and the Outsiders traded, collaborated, learned, and built together. Outsiders augured the doom of the Old Ones. The Rift unmade them both. The Outsiders coveted ancient Bukaizo. Its occupation was a hindrance. Machines were built on a foundation of outsider lies. When the machines were nearly done, the outsiders constructed bodies of flesh and bone. Skeletons, now. Their remains littering great Lokaizo. Ones which drew the spirits of the dead through a sieve. Finally, the outsiders fashioned a guardian to stand vigil over their work. Our bond with the old ones compelled us to trust their allies. They offered us a trade, eternal life for eternal service. We were ordered to slam shut the gates of Okaizo for all time. The Outsiders vanished from the world, leaving the Old Ones dumbfounded. Quiet gave way to chaos. Storms battered the seas. The sleeping hearts of mountains awoke with fury. When the last screams of the Old Ones faded, only we remained. None but the Green Colossus, whose every footstep disturbs tranquility. You are the first kith to visit the shores of Las Kaizo, and you will be the last. By now, you are rested, and there is little more to tell. May your journey through the wheel be an informed one. You chose death when you set your bearing, Traveler. Prepare yourself. Take him down. Yeah. No, no, nobody 
doing the job. I'm listening.
on. I hope you got a way of turning off that storm. Looks unfriendly. Mean spirited, even. Gilded Vale got its name from the way the wheat fields used to look in the sun. But this place... This place really is gilded. Might as well be a different world. Yeah. Seems they had a whole different way of looking at things. I'd say I like this one better, but the truth is... Neither one seems any closer to me. These great people got a funny way of passing on. They disappear from the world, but leave their problems behind for the rest of us to deal with. I guess maybe that's one good thing that's come out of this. Well, at least for me. I've got something to do with my life that doesn't involve hauling or shoveling. We even got a friend or two out of it. The whole world's about to face the biggest test it ever saw. What Aethys is doing, it's gonna change everything. You know... I broke a wheel once, too. First thing I thought of when we learned what Aethys was doing. My mom had this spinning wheel, and she loved it. Well, I was playing with it in the way a young child might when his parents are out, and that wheel came right off. It wouldn't go back into place, so I pushed it harder and harder, and pretty soon I'd broken off a spoke. Broke off three more trying to fix that. Anyway... I got whipped pretty good for it. That wheel was never the same, even after my dad fixed it. I used to think of the gods as being like parents to all of us. And now I know better. They're children, playing while their folks are gone. We gonna do this or what? If it's all the same to you, Watcher? I'd rather not miss the moment my god brings the darkness down upon us. I want to see Gaon become the true deity of death. Sure, you can trust me at your back. Even if you're going against my god. Tell me, Watcher, can there be a god of light and birth if souls themselves can no longer be reborn? It didn't work so good at Mogren's teeth, now. But sure, we can try to sway my god's will again. Well, if anyone could do it, I reckon it'd be you. I thought it'd be different how it turned out, but I couldn't dream of any other way. Now then, shall we go face my god for one last time? Find out what it is we can or can't do in these end times. Whether we're meant to wither or thrive, consider me your second shadow. So, here we stand on Lost Ukaizo. My parents gave me an earful about the horizon spanning beaches and towers reaching beyond the stars. All I can see is good folk tussling over a wasteland. Time to confront Aethys, hopefully for the last time. You know what you're doing? No time to waste then. I'm about as ready to confront a god as I'll ever be. Guess we should see what all the fuss is about. And if Ukaizo is worth the superstition. Captain, I... I don't know what's gonna happen to us, but... I want you to know... I'm not scared, and... I'm glad you're here with me. I know we can, Captain. We're good like that. Go give the green boy a piece of your mind. It wasn't the threat of death my procedure sought to avoid, but that of rebirth. Now I face the god of rebirth, who set on destroying the wheel. If I'd known in advance, perhaps I'd have held off on the experiment at sea. It kinda sounds like you want Aethys to succeed. Regardless, we are here now, and I stand ready. Let us finish this.
machine controlling the storm winds down. The clattering of its machinery settles into a low whir and then, at last, hiccups to a halt. Beyond the tower, the black, roiling clouds of Andra's mortar roll away from the ancient city of Ukaizo, with only a tired sigh of wind to see them off. And on that last breath of wind, comes to you a familiar sound. The ring of a bell. The bell's ringing is soft, not the clangor and torrent you've grown used to. It calls to your soul, and your soul yearns to follow it. Your soul flees from your body and into the beyond, chasing that sound. It leads you at last to Bareth's realm to that cold platform and room of endless doors. Watcher, your journey nears its conclusion. The pallid knight stands before you, her gaunt face impassive. You rush headlong toward the end. Do you ever pause to consider where it is you are headed? Soon you will confront Aethys for what will likely be the final time, and you will do so as the Herald of Barath, the only creature on the face of Aora to whom he will listen. Remember that. The pallid knight inclines her head to you, black hair hanging lank in her face. She steps back and seeds the floor to Helia with a small, resigned sigh. If Aethys truly intends to go through with his mad plan to destroy the wheel, a generation's worth of souls will be trapped in the in-between. So many would suffer. How can Aethys be so cruel? He cannot just abandon them. Aethys must help the kids find a quick solution. Abaddon strides forward. Aethys thrust this crisis on the kith. They did not bring it upon themselves. Their only mistake was entrusting us to watch over them. Who will help them rebuild their world now? Aethys will reveal every secret of the gods. Will Kith be able to change the established order if they have no wonder to inspire them? Aethys must help them resolve this quickly, lest every one of Aeora's few remaining mysteries be laid plain. You have misgivings. Good. You should be wary of any help Aethys might offer you. With the wheel destroyed, Kith will tear themselves apart. It is the gods' duty to prevent that happening, lest they doom us all. And as Kith must be ruled, so too must the gods. I say that if Aethys is so eager to throw down the mantle of power and step aside, I shall take my rightful place as Queen of the Gods again. Kith are strongest when they follow our lead, and we are strongest when we lead in turn. United in purpose with the gods, Kith can accomplish things that without us, they could never have even begun. They must be shown their boundaries to surpass them. Kith will not solve Aethys' puzzle on their own. And without an established order to fight against, the bonds that bind them dissolve, and they fight amongst themselves. That confidence is what will save Kith, Watcher. Do not lose it when you stand before Aethys. Mordecai's firm hand is but the motherly smothering of Helia by another name. Mortals should have no special advantages. Only once Kith have striven to improve themselves through trial will they truly know their measure. Kith must suffer to find their strength if they are to survive the world into which Aethas drags them. Our intervention in your struggle would be a cruelty and counter to our purpose. He lets his words hang in the air for a moment. Gaze level with your own. Indeed. Kith must discover for themselves what it is they are worth and of what it is they are capable. What we do for them, they do not learn for themselves. Trial breeds ingenuity. 
If our work of generations was not in vain, Kith will succeed in spite of Aethys' actions. I have faith in Kith's ability to meet Aethys' challenge. Do not mistake my words for indifference, Watcher. They are born from a fierce belief in your potential, not a refutation of it. And yet you come to Okaizo alone, with none at your back. All that Kith stand to lose. And even then your leaders could not join hands, squabbling instead of a prestige and resources. You believe that will change when my final death comes calling? You are a greater fool than I thought. Margren is blinded by her affection for mortals. She does not see that entropy is the destiny of all things. If Aethas were wise, he would destroy everything. End life. End reincarnation. End death. Kith have had their chance. It is time to let silence reign. As Rimmergon's words fade, the Pallid Knight returns. She no longer towers over you, a giant even among the gods, but meets you at your height. She lets the arms crossed over her chest fall to her sides. She speaks to you openly, plainly, an expression almost like tenderness, turning up the corners of her lips. Well, Watcher, you know where we stand. What do you believe? Take care that you do not sacrifice all, Watcher. Only what you must. The things you stand to lose. Lives, institutions, beliefs. You may lose for good. Now the time has come for us to part, Watcher. I laid upon you a difficult duty, and you discharged it well. You will be free of it in time, but not now. You have work to do yet. You are no stranger to hard choices. You killed Theos, and when his soul was laid bare before you, you chose to destroy his memories. You freed him from his past. Remember the strength it took to make that choice, and know that you alone may sway Aethys now. When you stand before him, choose your words carefully. The gods depart one by one in brooding silence. A solitary figure remains perfectly still until the last of her colleagues is out of earshot. Wodica peers down at you, a triumphant grin splitting her weathered features. Barath is a fool if she thinks I'll let her enjoy the last word. You were trusted with a heavy responsibility, Watcher. Speaking for mortals and representing their interests in the future to come. Instead of working with mortals, you came this far on your own. You rejected compromise, idealism, and the solutions of others. My every suspicion is confirmed. Society needs us. Aora searches for its queen and finds only an empty throne. I won't disappoint my subjects for long. Before we part, what compelled you to reject every dissenting voice and go your own way? Uh-huh. Consider my curiosity appeased. For now, in our grandest plans, you are a singularly unpredictable variable. Whether you heeded my wisdom or not, everything you've done to get this far has informed our view of mortal kind. I hope you're satisfied with your performance. We've learned much from each other. The trading companies, 
The locals, and even the pirates, had desperate, half-caught plans to counter this threat. You denied them all, rightfully judging mortals as ill-equipped to claim their destiny. I couldn't agree more. When at last I claim my place of leadership among you, the only challenge will be convincing the others to go along with my revised plan of Aeora. Aethas will no doubt have a sunnier outlook on mortals and their chances of success. He already has everything he wants, so go and listen to his empty-headed idealism. The rest of us will be sharpening our blades, preparing for the future he lays out for us. Priest lady, eh? You deserve better captain! Keep falling asleep on me. I'm gonna have to start walking behind you with a pillow. Oh, by the way, uh, the storm's gone. Also, I think Aethys is ended in the world. If all your missions involve this many head wounds, then I volunteer to set the next one out. Gods and darnation! My head! Here's a sight I never thought I'd see. A trencher turning his back on his own people. Two, in fact. All due respect, boss. Me being here has got nothing to do with the cause. I still believe, but there's more at stake. The Ranganui fed your family from his own table. Rawatai's finest warriors taught you to shoot. And this is how you use your gifts. What did it cost for you to sell out your homeland? Then die a traitor! Rawatayans, defend Ukaizo! Let's go! Death take you! on me! Still got it! As one! As one! Ha! Afraid not, Captain. <laughs> Afraid not, Captain. Oh! 
Tu. Okay. Well, don't see why not. You descend into the ancient winding streets of Ukaizo. Battered by storms for thousands of years, the ruins bear the marks of their role as the lone witnesses of the god's great secret at the center of the city. The houses and boulevards are pierced by great spears of luminous Audra. There are no ashen bodies, no birds, no sign or sound of any life. But with every step, the rhythmic pounding in the distance draws nearer. Soon, you can feel the vibration traveling up your spine. As you approach the center of the city, the weathered architecture gives way to more luminous Audra piercing the ruins, eventually overtaking them entirely. Cresting the top of a fallen tower, you finally get a clear view of Aethys. He stands, legs astride, next to a great stone monument ringed with eleven cavernous alcoves. All but three hold a gargantuan skeleton, bones scrubbed clean by the city's storms. An immense Anguithin machine floats above the monument, suspended by invisible energy emanating from a well of light beneath it. Great brass rings spin around a core of metal and Audra at the machine's center. Periodically, Aethys's massive arms swing back. The movement alone is enough to draw great gusts of wind toward him. When they come down on the machine, the impacts are accompanied by eruptions of electricity, fire, and smoke. The hundreds of luminous Audra pillars across Ukaizo sympathetically dim in a rippling wave that spreads out from the machine. The only safe route to the god is a steep ascent along a monstrous pillar of luminous Audra, intertwined with fragments of Ukaizo's ruins that it has carried through the centuries. The pillar bends in a long arc, towering above the machine. The pillar levels out near Aethys's head, a silent observer to the destruction of the machine it has grown beside over thousands of years. You weave your way along a treacherous rain-slicked path up the pillar's skyward side. As you arrive at the top, you catch Aethys's attention. Fifth in this way. It may be hard to picture, but this city was once full of life. The Hawana, yes, but also kith from many other cultures. Great hanging trees shadowed these boulevards. Gardens sprawled across the open rooftops. Each spring, a festival procession would wind its way from the hillside into this valley. The celebrants would pass through a steep walk among the stalls of foreign merchants, flowers falling upon them from all sides. All people of all nations, together in a celebration of new life. Such was the power and beauty of lost Ukaizo. Been a while, old friend. Widewin, I did not think to see you here. But few things go as expected when the Watcher is involved. We were a good team, once. But this isn't what we fought for. Ain't you just burning the harvest because you planted the wrong seeds? 
An astute observation, old friend. Consider instead that I am giving the soil back to those who till it. Spring must always follow winter. As long as there are people committed to finding the other side of change, the agony will not last. But thank you for challenging me as you did in fairer times. I haven't forgotten the lesson we strove to impart. You're welcome, I suppose. If we don't fix this mess you're about to cause, the whole world is gonna look this bad. I mean, it's a mighty heavy load you're putting on our shoulders. I just hope we can carry it. As long as there are people like you in this world, Adair, I truly do. This power has always been in the grasp of mortals. Now you will finally be aware of it. Now you will be able to decide what to do with it. Yukazo's corpse is beautiful, my god. This, its current state, is but one spoke in the ever-turning wheel of life and death, and so no less worthy than its incarnation at birth. But you seek to break that wheel. I beseech you, Gon, that when you do, you do it right. Burn to ash every Audra root in hell so that it may never regrow. Let the darkness reign eternal. It saddens me that the harvesting of souls in my name has brought you to this place, Shoti. But I am the cause, and I must take responsibility for it. I can only hope that after I am gone, you will see there is a brighter future for mortals. It is a future that you can help shape, even if you cannot see it now. Rawatai gave everything they had to reach this place. In the end, they fell short of hitting the mark. Will we ever have another chance to prosper? Or was this damn island our last hope? Only you can answer that question, Maya. Rawatai has persevered through great adversity. The storms that ravaged your homeland have ended. But that in itself may present new challenges for your people. It is my hope that after I am gone, Rawatai will work together with its rivals to create a new world, instead of fighting over the ruins of the old. But what of you, Watcher? Why have you followed me? Have you come to bear witness to the breaking of the wheel? Mortals are already inspired. It is what has pushed them on for hundreds of generations to reach this point in time. Animancy is poised to go far beyond what we and Gwythans ever discovered. Why do you, why does Helia, think I should lend more power to mortals? As do I. From where should mortals draw their inspiration? Very well, Watcher. I will ensure that mortals are inspired by my passing, that my power not be expended in vain. Indulge me in a moment's curiosity. There is something I wish to know about Aora, about Kith, that I can only learn through your eyes. You followed me all this way, dodging an armada, navigating an impenetrable wall of storms, Voyaging across uncharted seas, besting a guardian who existed to bar your trespass, with the machinations of gods echoing in your ears. And you did so on your own. That is no small achievement. Kith across Aora will hear the tale of it, and look to you with awe. I believe that mortals possess the strength to collaborate and shape a future of their own design. Not all of my brothers and sisters agree, 
I had hoped your actions would set an example for the future. Demonstrating the resilience and ingenuity of mortals when they work together. Coming to Ukaizo unencumbered by alliances proves a different point than the one I intended. But it is a valuable one all the same. What inspired your decision, Watcher? Did the choice echo your foundational beliefs? Or were you influenced by observation? I thank you for your perspective. Yours is not the only opinion that concerns me. But for the moment, it offers much to consider. All I ever wanted for mortals was growth, transformation. Once, my brothers and sisters shared this goal. Some have forgotten themselves, giving in to fatalism or tyranny. Others have succumbed to apathy. It brings me great sorrow that crisis is the only way to set the future in motion. Would that I could pass the responsibility of heralding your darkest hour to another. You shirked the aid of others and came this far alone. But I think you'll find that the future is built on trust, cooperation, and understanding among kith. Ask. You are entitled to any answer that is mine to give. The great work of the Ingwithans falls to ruin. Reincarnation as we know it will end. Souls which currently await new life in the beyond will be born into the world as normal, but their numbers will not replenish. Anything that dies will tarry in the void of the in-between awaiting the motion of a wheel that no longer turns. Once the beyond has emptied, every birth will be hollow-born. Other maladies of the soul may follow and plague those who linger in life. Unless mortals work together to carve a new path, the essence of life will be trapped in the netherworld. Gods will starve. Aora will grow silent and cold. A generation or more. That much essence is already poised to flow into Aora. But unlike an hourglass, no amount of turning will compel the sand to reverse its course. Should you choose, you could lay down your burden and trust in your children's children to set matters right. That depends entirely on you. By your reckoning, there are still good years to come. By ours, time is short. Yes, they must work toward a solution or perish. If that task is beyond their skill, then they no longer deserve their position. I would have them justify their right to lead. That could mean swallowing their pride and hearkening to the wisdom of mortals. Some, I expect, will perform better than others. When we tamed the cycle of reincarnation, we broke what had once functioned naturally and without intervention. The flow of essence will not normalize on its own. Essence will simply pool in the void of the in-between, never passing through Adra networks to the beyond. The dead will be left to wander in darkness, confusion, and sorrow. For several reasons. My strength was diminished after the Godhammer bomb, and assuming this form took incredible effort. With so many vying for control of the Deadfire, I also saw a ripe opportunity for mortals to cast aside their differences and stand together as one. They have never been more powerful, more capable. Because of this, the gods must justify their importance or be proven obsolete. No one is worthy of unconditional trust. If you feel the gods are beyond forgiveness, then they don't deserve your obedience. Make your future one that doesn't require them. Should you choose to accept the gods, I hope that you temper your faith with skepticism. 
Whitaker is entitled to her opinion. If the intent of this test is to justify an uprising to come, the other gods must decide for themselves if mortals are ready to dictate their future. Should Whitaker's tyranny prove the only alternative, mortals must prepare for a terrible conflict. Your perspective bridges eternity, Watcher. Many will look to you to mediate differences that could shake the very foundations of Aora. I apologize, Watcher. There is nothing I can do to restore the glory of your hard-won and poorly situated estate. What happened to Kad Nua was not personal in nature. I would have occupied the statue even if it was buried beneath Defiance Bay. Given your perseverance, I know that a second home cannot be distant in your future. You have only to seek it out. I must attend to my final work now. I cannot delay any longer. You have carried a heavy burden across the Deadfire, Watcher. Before I go, I would rid you of it. You are free now, as free as any of us can be. Many will come to you for help in the years ahead. Animancers, priests, even the gods themselves. I have great hope for you, but always remember that your future is for you to decide. Use your freedom well. Aethys squares himself to the machine. As you move to a safe distance, he draws his fist back and resumes his assault. The blows rain down with increased fervor, but the machine perseveres in spite of his efforts. Spreading his arms wide, Aethys draws power from the luminous Audra clustered around the valley. The energy courses through his body, limbs overflowing with intense light and waves of heat. He returns to his task, each strike bringing with it the sound of cracking stone and twisting metal, the flickering of luminous Audra across Ukaizo. As the ancient machine finally begins to succumb to his strength, so too does Aethys's body, built to withstand the passage of thousands of years. The great Audra statue has finally been pushed beyond its limits. Cracks appear along the hands, then race up the arms. Aethys does not slow his assault, but continues unabated. Its brass rings twisted. The machine spins erratically, but withstands the relentless barrage. Aethys stands astride it and pummels the base of the machine. Soul energy begins to flare out from the machine's heart, warping the air with the intense heat. Aethys drives his right fist into the machine's center, the core of metal and Audra. The god lets out a deafening shout, something between a cry of anguish and a roar of exultation. You see Aethys' arm shatter upward from his hand through his elbow. A flash of light and heat bursts from the core, accompanied by a cacophony of destruction. The moment passes as Aethys' shout echoes throughout the valley, your eyes begin to recover. The god's work is accomplished. The great machine of Ukaizo has been destroyed. The wheel has been unmade. As Aethys' voice fades, the enormity of what you've accomplished sinks in. You have confronted a god. You have rediscovered the ancient city where the wheel was forged, and you have seen the wheel shattered. What comes next is uncertain, but already the legend spreads of the Watcher, who survived Andra's mortar and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Aethys. On your recommendation, Aethys disperses his essence and that of the thousands of souls within him 
to centers of knowledge and learning around the world. Animancers, engineers, wizards, and scholars of all stripes make astounding breakthroughs in understanding and harnessing the phenomena that govern Aeora. While some of these developments prove beneficial to Kith, others are decidedly less so. But such is the price of innovation. What remains to be seen is how, indeed, whether they will restore the cycle Aethys has broken. In reaching Ukaizo and facing Aethys, you have accomplished the impossible. And you have done it without the assistance of the great powers of Deadfire. Your feats capture the awe and imagination of a world that needs heroes more than ever. Some say your intervention prevented Aethys from a far worse act of destruction. Many believe you will be the salvation of Aeora. With each day, your legend grows, as does the chaos in Deadfire. Ukaizo remains unclaimed, and the Afekia Channel becomes the site of a near constant battle as the Juana and the Rawatayans vie for control of the unprotected island. The Rawatayans rely on their cannons, and the Juana call forth massive waves and beasts of the deep to sink their foes. And while they chip away at one another, the Valians and the Principi pursue their own ends with increasing abandon. Emboldened by their rival's distraction, the Valian Trading Company seizes territory and mines Luminous Audra at a startling pace. Juana villages are left at the mercy of unscrupulous speculators, and resource-rich islands are swarmed and stripped. To support their operations, the Valian Trading Company begins shipping ever greater quantities of supplies and luminous Audra to and from the archipelago. This attracts the attention of the Principi, who target these ships with increasing aggression. The promise of fat prizes draws even more pirates to their ranks. The Rawatayans, as well as the Juana, are too busy to stop them. The mysterious deaths of Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikawa provoke hostilities between the Valian settlers and the Huawan residents. What starts with angry words escalates to retaliatory killings as each side blames the other. By the time anyone bothers to question the strange coincidences surrounding their deaths, including reports of a cloaked Omawi woman seen in both the port and the village, both sides have gone too far to turn back. As the balance of power changes in Deadfire, so too does Nekataka transform. With the major powers at one another's throats, Nekataka becomes a maelstrom of chaos. Spies and smugglers follow the flow of refugees into the city, where violence is commonplace. Ukaizo remains the coveted prize and Nekitaka fades into an afterthought. The Kahanga leadership takes responsibility for the welfare of the Raparu, and the gullet starts to improve. What was once a den of crime, poverty, and illness slowly becomes a quiet haven for the Raparu. With Skiarelifus's essence still empowering the Water Shapers Guild, the practice of water shaping grows and flourishes in Nekitaka, and its practitioners rise in prestige. They install conveyors in the falls that run through the city and craft sculptures for every street and plaza. Thus, the Water Shapers Guild becomes a power in its own right in the city of Nekataka. Your brief encounter with Lefarn proves deeply influential for the children of the Dawn Stars. Plagued with nightmares and haunted by the deaths at Hesango, Latharn begins questioning his faith in Aethys. At first, his fellow Dawn Stars chide him. But that changes as word of Aethys' deeds at Ukaizo spreads. After all, what business have they worshipping a god who denied his own legitimacy? The faith of the children of the Dawn Stars fades, but their commitment to the people of Deadfire does not. They continue feeding, healing, and helping the neediest, just as they have for decades. It is no longer a holy mission, but it is a mission all the same. Ruanu, the chieftain of the Juana at Tikawara, 
dies mysteriously. The tribe finds his body washed up on the same beach where Anaharu challenged him to the trial of waves. Some blame Anaharu's vengeful spirit. Others see it as Ngati's final judgment. And a few speak of a strange man seen lingering in the village. The leaderless tribe eventually scatters. Some head to Nekataka, while others seek out the Wahaki. The dragon, Nereskirlas, no longer passes between Aeora and the White Void, and the dead flow slowly breaks apart, exposing the temple long frozen within. Under Halfjorn's guidance, the Harbingers of Dusk resettle within Remergon's temple, vowing to forever protect it from the defiling touch of outsiders. Over time, the group becomes increasingly reclusive and fanatical, attacking any who dare approach their holy site. In besting the Beast of Winter, you earned the Death God's mercy rather than his enmity. The deity remains characteristically unforthcoming about his decision, and you're left to wonder whether in doing battle with him in the White Void, you somehow furthered his apocalyptic ambitions. Utterly corrupted by the tooth of Tawamawai, the Adra at the primal island of Kazuwari continues to remain separated from the greater beyond. As increasingly anguished spirits roam the island in search of essence, blights form with greater frequency. The wildlife suffers and the jungle thins as Kazuwari slowly dies. Weakened by the events at the island, Galloway retreats further from the intrigues of the gods. Rumors spread of his displeasure as those godlikes touched by the father of monsters begin dying mysteriously across the whole of Aora. The faces of the hunt continue to rule the Crucible and Galloway's, or rather, Tawamawai's name. The trials summoned by the statue grow deadlier with each season until only those rare few willing to brave the gravest of dangers seek out the bloody ordeals of Kazuwari. Like the other souls following in your wake, Muatu eventually yearns to move on to the beyond and the wheel. Stymied by Aethys's actions, however, he settles on returning to Kazuwari, where he joins the choir of souls that echo throughout the Crucible. Encouraged by her arcane successes, Bakarna returns to her observatory to continue her studies of the celestial spheres. In time, her colleagues in the Circle of Archmagi come to accept her among their number. She takes on apprentices, and they trumpet her praises as both a brilliant innovator and nurturing pedagogue. Slain by your hand, the Titan of Wal poses little further threat to Aeora. As the corpse decays, it putrefies into a massive nest of hungry fungal monstrosities. Vessels that anchor off the shores of the Black Isles tend to go missing, only to turn up shipwrecked months or even years later against distant shores. With time, the body collapses upon itself, and the Black Isles finally implode. Seeking a living receptacle for the essence contained within the tomes you unearthed in the Halls Obscured, Langrath devotes herself to study of the God Seed. She occasionally contacts you, usually on Dragonback, to solicit your expertise and advice. Her progress with the ancient Anguithan device remains steady, if excruciatingly slow. Though your adventures alter the destiny of Aeora, and the balance of power in Deadfire, they also leave a lasting mark on those who travel at your side. Your companions find themselves changed in ways both big and small. Adair returns to Hisongo, where he reunites with Burn, the son of his former lover, Alava. The boy takes heart in Adair's account that Aethys and all the other gods were false, petty, and unworthy of the love of Kith. Realizing how close he came to dying for this cause, Byrne finds renewed purpose in working alongside his uncle, 
to repair the many scars left upon Deadfire by the gods. Under Adair's guidance, Burn grows into the kind of irreverent, stubborn hothead that would have made his mother proud. And Adair visits her gravesite, often to tell her so. Shodi is not a priestess who understands the meaning of subtlety. As such, she makes her girlish crush on Adair painfully obvious from the moment she first sets eyes on the strapping fighter. Early in your travels, Adair appears discomforted by her persistent flirting. He often grimaces when she sidles up to him, and he takes endless pains to keep their conversations terse and to the point. But after a little smoothing on your part to nudge them in the right direction, Adair makes an effort to view Shodi with an open mind. And Shodi begins teasing the veteran fighter in a more companionable and less amorous manner. After saving each other's hides a couple times and sharing more than a few laughs, the two form an easy, and you suspect, lifelong friendship. Plagued by constant nightmares and hallucinations, Shodi becomes increasingly disassociated from reality. Meanwhile, her power continues to grow with every soul she harvests. You start to notice sliced up animal corpses everywhere you two travel. But when confronted about it, Shodi stomps her feet and fiercely denies any wrongdoing. Then, one night, Shodi wakes, but never leaves the nightmare. Shivering uncontrollably, she packs up her belongings and slips away into the darkness, murmuring that she must return to the Temple of Gone in order to fulfill her purpose to her god. But she never reaches the temple. None of the Dawn Stars know what's become of her, aside from disturbing rumors of a harvester ravaging the southeastern islands in the dead fire, leaving a trail of blood in her wake. Aloth renews his commitment to transforming the Leaden Key from a tool of secrecy and oppression into a watchdog organization. With the wheel broken, he reasons the world will need wise and responsible leadership more than ever. It is a lofty goal, and one he does not expect to finish in his lifetime. But if there's one thing he's learned from the Watcher, it's that a single person can change the world. You let Romaro go, and the former pirate ostensibly set sail for the trade lanes of the Eastern Reach, the Edier Empire, Old Valia, and the Republics. For the remainder of your time together, Seraphin seems, if not exactly happy, at least contented with the outcome of your confrontation with his former mentor at Sayuka. After your encounter with Aethys, the pirate drifts into quiet contemplation. As you sail into your next port, he meets you at the ship's rail. He'll be leaving the gods to you going forward, he tells you, and saving his bullets for those like to die from them. Seraphin parts company with you not long after. Occasionally, in the years that pass, you hear tales of his ship, the taste of freedom, and its violent exploits against any and all who would purchase or purvey Kith. After reporting back to her superiors for the Watcher's actions against the Valian Trading Company, Palagina is rewarded with reassignment home to the Valian Republics. She spends the next several years as the head of the household guard for the Duke of Ancense. In this role, she is often lauded for her courage and loyalty. Even with all of the praise, there are still times when she cannot help but feel she could have had more influence on what transpired in the Deadfire. Despite her good fortunes in the Deadfire, Palagina mourns the loss of Jackalow for years. She curses herself for not finding her friend sooner, for not protecting him from Captain Tutzadl and his crew. On a few lonely nights, Palagina composes letters to the Watcher, asking what more they could have done to save him. They are never sent. Although she had made it through her second adventure with the Watcher, 
Pelagina regrets that she never found her childhood friend, Giacolo. She searches far and wide, across the dead fire and beyond, but never finds him. Pleased with the Navy's conduct throughout the dead fire campaign, Maya returns to active duty. She can find a free drink and a sharp salute anywhere she goes in Rawatayan territory. In recognition of her performance, the Navy attempts to give Maya less strenuous work. She flatly refuses, throwing herself into the fray whenever she can. Her rifle never has time to cool. Though Maya's covert assignment in the dead fire is considered a success, few claim knowledge of it or openly congratulate her. She receives no praise beyond knowing glances or the occasional raised tankard from her countrymen. She never responds. There's never enough free time to explore your mutual connection. Something about your bond feels unfinished. But as your paths diverge, you start running out of reasons to see each other. In your presence, she's always armed with a pleasant smile and lots of questions. Her embrace is full of warmth. If there isn't time now, someday there might be. She looks forward to seeing her brother again. So does Ashiza. Takei who distances himself from the problems of the dead fire, giving the tribes a reprieve from godlike omens. And Gati's silence speaks volumes. The Juana grow to rely on each other, paving a new way forward divorced from their traditions. Soon after he departs Negataka, distant tribes report of unusual and salacious water sculptures appearing on the shores. These quaint visitations are widely celebrated. The identity of the artist, ever an open question. Your farewell is short and cordial. Nothing further needs to be said, and you wish each other well. Takehu does not look back. The sea feels restless in his absence. Your pursuit of Aethys and your journey to Ukaizo signal the end of forces that have shaped the lives of Kith and the course of nations. The cycle of reincarnation has been broken. The storms of Andra's mortar have calmed. Yet each ending promises a new beginning. As the sun rises over Ukaizo, Kith turn their gaze eastward, wondering at what lies beyond. And at the as the watcher of Kadnua and the former herald of Bareth, you return to your ship and begin the long journey home. You hope for calm weather. <laughs>